So this, this conversation is just extending the conversation we had this morning. Uh, but again, just having conversation, talking, seeing where we stand in terms of lots of these issues. But the thing that I want you to leave with is I want you to think about a learning need that you might have either around issues of equity that we've talked about this morning or just some other professional learning need that you might have because I'd like for you to leave developing some sort of a, the first thoughts of a strategy to get from current state to desired state. And so there'll be work involved and there'll be times for you to get feedback from your colleagues in the room around some of these ideas. And what I would love to be able to do if we had like 10 hours is every one of us would present an idea and get feedback from our colleagues and we go through this, what I'm calling a tuning protocol to do that. There won't be time. So I'm hoping several of you will find benefit in the process because the process itself is kind of its own learning experience. But then also several of you will find, I hope, benefit in the advice that you get from your colleagues. And so the one thing I'll ask you to do as we go through this process is, this is another one of those lean in uh, to it because there'll be parts of the process where you're like, well, why do we have to do it that way? And as with any protocol when it comes to professional learning, I always suggest do it the way the protocol is the first time, but then later think about what might you tweak in this protocol if you were you know, leading your own session or suggesting a session that someone else was doing, then make those tweaks. But the first time, just kind of do it in its purest form uh, and then kind of see what you think. So that's, that's the goal. Uh, keeping this in mind, so this was right after we looked at the bike backwards bicycle video and how long it takes to change mindsets and biases and, and all those things. And we didn't get a chance to talk much about that video earlier. So I'm wondering what were some of your other reactions or thoughts connected to the backwards bicycle video, any part of it? You're on the edge, of, you're about to say something, so. It, it, it makes me a little bit sad how long it takes to mm -hmm. learn something new, and then you learn something new, and then you lost the old thing you had. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Your mm -hmm. old perspective. So mm -hmm. it was like, oh gosh, you have that kind of time to change something. Right. Be so focused 110% of the time. And I think there's a, a couple points in that. So how many of you have like a smartphone? Okay, so whenever the new download comes, right, a bunch of things that were swipe up before and now swipe right or left or uh, like all these changes, and some things like they just become intuitive and you do pick it up fairly quickly. It's like, okay, that learning didn't take 18 months or eight months rather, but I was able to figure it out fairly quickly. Other, there's stuff on my iPhone, I have no idea to this day how they work. And I see people do some, some things, like how did you get your phone to do that? Like what app do you have? That's just a regular phone, that's what it's supposed to do. So I, you know, not everything takes that amount of time, but you're right, to, to change a significant mental bias laden process or way of thinking about something does take a lot of time and it does take a lot of work. And to your point, uh, there are times when you do lose the old thing in order to move into the new. And in some cases, that's okay. And in other cases, you sometimes lose something that you kind of liked and now it's gone. So that's a great point. Yeah. To, to piggyback on what you're saying, two things. One thing is, I wonder if he kept practicing with both bikes, if he would be able to internalize being able to ride both bikes mm. that wouldn't matter. Interesting, and yeah. The second thing is, that was a yellow area from your previous, I mean, he didn't even know he didn't know that he couldn't ride that bike. Right, yep. Because everyone sort of thinks, like he showed, that they can do it. Like, of course I can do it, right? I mean, that's part of it. And all, because our mindset is, I know what you've done to the bike, so therefore, mechanically, I know what the issue is. So all I have to do is do this little switch in my brain and I should be fine. He didn't know that he couldn't do that as did the people who tried to do it on stage. So it gives me hope because I think eventually, if you really want to incorporate all of those things, you just have to continue to be diligent and give time. Are, are you a Mac person or a PC person? I'm a Mac person, but I've been both. You've been both. And so that whole notion of being both and continuing to stay well-versed in both becomes really important. And that's something I've had to do because I'm in sessions where I'm with Mac folks and PC people. And unless you stick with both and really focus on all the changes that are happening with both, you start to lose out. Yeah, so I think that's a great point. Yeah. 
two, two pieces. Piece number one is, as an adult, he had that eight month issue. Mm -hmm. And then it took him 20 minutes to kind of flip the switch back. Mm -hmm. But as a kid, didn't have that big an issue. Mm -hmm. It did go from, I was riding this bike to two weeks and I was riding the backwards bike. Right. And which makes me recognize uh, when we are helping to form our children, <laughs> recognize they don't have all the issues we have. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, to the technology itself, uh, I heard a term recently, it was digital natives. Mm -hmm. So our children, and I do this, every time I walk into my kid's house, my son is 33, has a four-year-old daughter, and they use the device, no, not the Wii, it's the Xbox. And when the Xbox is supposed to be showing me a movie and the TV is connected to that, I just hand the Xbox controller <laughs> to the <laughs> four-year-old. And I'm like, Avery, we want to watch whatever it is, you know? And she does it, and I'm like, thank you. Yeah. And, and I think that allows the children to recognize that we have respect for them as digital natives mm -hmm. <laughs> in right. order to, and, and that, you know, taking that into the classroom with our adults, I, I try to do the same thing in that mm -hmm. we are respectful of the knowledge they bring. Yes, so important uh, on so many levels. And, you know, I'm laughing because I'm thinking of my first our D, our VHS player that we had. And so I still have. Right. Our neighbors on the street had the Betamax, so, you know, laughing at them still uh, for making that choice. But anyway, um, it had a, a remote control, which we were highfalutin because we had a remote control, but there was a cord attached to it up to the thing. So, like, it was a remote with a cord, which kind of defeats the purpose. But anyway, uh, you're right. Like, our kids bring so much. And it's technology, but it's also the way they engage in the world is so different and how do we honor that and bring it into our learning experiences. Great point. So, the, but this whole notion that this takes time, I think was the big message behind the video and the slightest thing can take us off course. And so how do we continue to give people time to practice something, but even after they get it, give them time to keep using it so they don't lose it. Because anyone who's learned a new, uh, foreign language, you don't use it, you start to lose it. I was amazing in Spanish in high school. And then I was recently in Peru, where you saw the picture, and I was just like, okay, I know how to say hello and go to the bathroom. Like, those are my two things that are left from like a year in high school Spanish, because I haven't used it. And so that's part of the challenge. So when we're thinking about professional learning, this, the color doesn't seem to work well here, but on the left, remember I asked you at the beginning to write down your beliefs around, or your opinions around professional learning? And some people, their experience is on the left. It's all about short-term, quick events. Like, it's not deep engagement around anything. It's about technical knowledge. Here's how you do this. Here's how you use the phone. Here's how you use this uh, remote. Um, and, you know, it's all about compliance. And what we're suggesting is in an environment where professional learning is the norm, and I know it's just a play on words for some, but for us, it's sort of a meaningful difference. It's about long-term engagement around a smaller set of ideas. So we may not be able to learn about everything quickly, but we may learn a few things deeply, and that will be more meaningful in the long run in terms of changing practice. And this whole notion of, if it's not connected to the work that I do, so if it's just like all these discrete events over here that don't connect to my actual job, then I'm gonna be less likely to pay attention because I can't see a way to use these ideas. Uh, and then this whole notion of it's conceptual and theoretical, but practical as well. So that combination of all of that, and this it's not about right now, it's about thinking to the future, it's about me as a learner taking ownership of my own learning. So a couple of differences in terms of the one versus the other. Now, in order for us to really get into this kind of conversation, we gotta have some trust. And if you look at, I'll read it because it's kind of hard to see from where you are. How many of you like Dilbert? Is Dilbert even still in the paper? Okay. So he starts off, uh, his boss, the boss comes and says, hey guys, how are your families? And they're like in shock that he even asked a question. He says, why are you pretending to be interested in our personal lives? And he says, well, it's a management technique to increase your job satisfaction without giving you more money. 
And so the boss says, my plan is to boost your intangible benefits while continuing to chisel away at your salaries. Mm -hmm. And the boss goes on to say, but enough about me. How are those families of yours? And so my wife divorced me because you make me work so many hours. <laughs> this job lowers my self-esteem too much to attract a mate. And he says, well, tell them I said hi. <laughs> so, you know, we get to this point where, you know, in order to really dive into some of the conversations that we had this morning, we got to build the trust. We got to really be authentic in building that trust. And I would argue we talk about this notion of kasab as a way of thinking about our new knowledge and our new thinking. And it's an interesting acronym, uh, and you can see what each of the letters stand for. So when you think about everything that you heard this morning, there are certain things that were knowledge that may have been new knowledge, may have been old knowledge, but there were things that you learned. Then there's this whole notion of, so what was your attitude coming into this learning? Was it, I'm eager to learn and I'm positive and I know this is something I need? And if you look at the aspiration, like is there an internal motivation to engage in this kind of learning? Or was it a flip of, okay, I know I need to check off a box, I need to get some hours in and this is a way to do it. So we, in our learning experiences, how do we pay attention to and recognize that people come in with different attitudes and aspirations and not assume that they're all the same? Uh, and then the skill being this whole notion of we can learn a lot of things, but we may not know how to apply necessarily what we learned. So how do we take time and give ourselves space to think about how to apply what we learn? So when you think about the equity framework this morning, there were some new ideas that were presented. Do you immediately know how to apply those ideas? And what would be helpful for you to know and it would help you think about how to apply some of those ideas? Because the skills that you need to apply that knowledge become really important. And then I would argue in a professional learning setting, how do we give people time to do both? Get the knowledge, but also develop some skills and how to apply it. Because at the end of the day, what do we want to see change? The behaviors. We want consistent application of these new ideas uh, and these new practices. So later, when you're thinking about, so what's a strategy that I want to work on or what's an issue that my department or school is facing, I'm going to ask you to keep Kasab in the back of your mind as you develop your strategy so that whatever ideas you want to share with your colleagues, it may pay attention to some of these letters. What questions do you have on Kasab before I go to the next screen? That's part of it. So part of what, and that's why it's so important, it's not just your own attitude, it's the attitude of the learners in the room and your recognition that their attitudes might be different from your own or different from each other. So how do you create a learning experience that honors the various attitudes? And I use the word, um, uh, so, and, and or beliefs and biases that people bring to the experience. Because if we don't give space for that, and just assume, well, you're all here because you want to be here and you all want to learn and you care about this issue deeply, so I'm just going to start with that and assume that's where we all are and realize, oh, no, we're not maybe all in that same place. So it's, a, it's about creating uh, an environment that acknowledges that that's the reality. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Other questions? I've been practicing on my wait time. My wait time is usually three seconds. <laughs> and I just jump in and say, well, what I meant to say was, but I've been trying to extend that to be a little longer. So this is the tool that I'll ask you to come back to later, okay? So the conversation I want you to have right now is when you think about your own work environment and where you are in your department or your school or wherever it might be, is it structured to allow for, remember we talked about teacher collective efficacy, conversations about practice, conversations about the work, sharing of ideas and best practices. Does your work environment right now allow for that? Please have that conversation with somebody who's near you uh, and groups of two, three, four, or however many there are. So just want to hear from two people at least. What was your response to this question? Yes.
you know, group discussion, you know, we're not included in the, in like staff meetings mm -hmm. or the, the Wednesday professional okay. development mm -hmm. in the school mm -hmm. or PLCs or anything like that. And so we kind of have to scramble to just hear what's happening out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, I take a lot of courses though through professional learning that the district offers and that's kind of where I, I have an avenue to ask and what do you think, how should I handle this? Mm -hmm. And also hear and learn from other people like, okay, yeah, I could be doing that differently. Mm -hmm. A lot of the kids that I see are, you know, the ones that are in trouble. You know, they have to sit in the office during recess for their detention or yeah. um, some kind of home situation. I know my family just kind of try to deal with them. So, the, so through professional learning, things like this. Where you get your, your knowledge and your information. Not at, the, not at the school level. So let me ask, is there someone in a school setting where, uh, like as you describe your situation, does someone have a different situation that would be more ideal in their school? <laughs> so anything close. <laughs> Okay, so that's something that we want to, that might be the idea that you take to this bigger conversation. Because I think there are ways that we can think about, like if you had, if it was like you were in charge of professional learning in the school, what would help make that different? What could create a different situation? What kind of structures could we put in place uh, that would allow teachers and other staff members to engage in learning together? Uh, what could we do as part of our early release days? Like there's different things that we could start to put on the table. And what I'm hoping that you'll walk out of here with is just to unpack your, uh, your mind and like expand your thinking a little bit collectively so we can start to think about some ideas that we might be able to present to the leadership in our schools and in our district to say, here's what would help my learning. And if we're, particularly when we're talking about these issues of equity and, and how deep these conversations are going, if they're all happening and then you have to like catch the breadcrumbs from those discussions just to get a morsel of any piece, then how could we expect you uh, to then adhere to all these new practices that we've all agreed upon are important? So I think that's part of what we want to think through uh, and just get some conversation going because the one thing I heard from Tiffany and the one thing I heard from your superintendent yesterday was, if you got an idea, bring it to me. And so that's what I hope that we'll leave today with this, just some ideas to, to address that issue. Someone, yeah. So, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm just going to go ahead and lay it on. get it out there. Just, uh, <laughs> it's a safe space. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it seems like the, the whole diversity issue initially centered around um, you know, racial, racial, mm -hmm. social, um, <laughs> those kinds of, of things. But there's, there's a deep seated bias uh, among the administration. And then you have certified versus classified. And that's that's the problem. Another the problem. great divide. When I, when I said that I started as a BTS, and I don't know, that, you know what a BTS is, educational technology sport. Um, but um, I, I was I was the odd man out. Mm -hmm. And I was not included in, in really any group or either group. And uh, now, I mentioned I'd be paying maintenance at the high school, so I'm a custodian. Mm -hmm. Well, there are a lot of people that say, what am I doing in these classes? It's like, wait a minute. What we do is not necessarily define who we are. Mm -hmm. The fact that I have you know, 20 years of making finance and, uh, and technology, mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of life experiences, a lot of you know, experiences in, in management, things like that. None of that matters because when people see me walking down the hall, yeah. you know, pull my car behind me, they go, oh, you're a lost. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just, you know. Or, on the other hand, I could walk in wearing a suit and a tie, and all of a sudden, you've got respect. It's like, wait a minute, we should be respecting one another's people, mm -hmm. um, regardless of anything else. We can also respect you that we want to, to be better, not only in our jobs, but we also be a person. And, and the reality is, you don't know who the child's going to see first on any given day. That you just don't know. And it could be you, it could be the bus driver, it could be the person in the front office, like you just don't know. And that first conversation could 
make or break that child, given depending on what happened at home that day before. And so that's just one of a million reasons why all of us need to be engaged in the conversations that folks are having around these issues because all of us could make or break the day of a child based on one comment or based on one. And if we let one of our biases get in the way, it could go the wrong way fast. And so I agree, we have to figure out ways for everyone to be involved in this learning. But I think your earlier point of the other great divide that we have, we have to figure that out too. Uh, no one should feel any less than anyone else in a school district because we're all here for the kids. They're Period. The customer. Yeah, they're the customer. That's what we're doing this for. Mm -hmm. And each of us has a role to play uh, when it comes to meeting the needs of our children. But the, the point of this conversation is also we have to figure out ways to have the conversation, the one that you're having right now in this room, needs to happen in the schools and in the other settings as well because if it doesn't, then we don't benefit from all your expertise and all that you know. I remember when I became the principal of the elementary school in Ohio, uh, the, the person who was our, um, like our building engineer handed me the keys to the building and was crying as he was handing me the keys to the building and basically was saying, if you're half the principal that she was who just left, then, and then he couldn't finish because he was so distraught. <laughs> he cared so much for that school that the thought of someone else coming in to his school and trying to be the principal it just was overwhelming to him because he was involved in all of the learning. He was involved in all of the conversations. He knew what was happening in each of the classrooms. He knew the teaching strategies that were happening across the, the school. And when he came to the professional learning sessions, because he was in every room, he was the one who was a, more so than the principal, able to say, well, I saw Mrs. So-and-so do this, and she, it was brilliant, and the kids loved it, and was in the know uh, when it came to the work that was, and all the things that were going on in the school. So I could see why he was so distraught at the idea of somebody new coming in. But the point is, everyone needs to be engaged in the learning. And so part of what I hope that you take back uh, is some strategies for how to make that happen. So I'm gonna show you a professional learning experience and you answer the question for me, is this professional learning? I'm sorry, I can't listen to more. <laughs> That's as far as I can usually go with this one. I held on as long as I could. Okay. So, say, say again? Re-education camp. Oh, right, right. So this happened somewhere. I, I happen to know the district, but I'll hold that to myself for now. And somebody who was in it, in the room, just put their phone up and said, this is happening, and started recording. Um, well, right, right. So they, they kept, it keeps going like that. Uh, and this was the professional learning in the district. And this was like a representation of what was happening. And what's so sad about that is um, the people who were, and I had a chance to talk to the department that this, is, that this was a strategy that they thought was really effective. This whole parroting, parroting strategy was one that they thought, well, if you say it enough times, you'll eventually internalize it. Uh, so no one's talking to each other. No one's really having conversation. But well-meaning, well-intentioned people designed this. And this was the strategy for professional learning in the district. So I want you to just, we're not going to watch the whole thing, but just contrast that to, and, and again, when it comes to professional learning, we just can't do the same old bad stuff. I want you to watch this video and tell me if this is a professional learning team and just tell me what you think, what, what we expect to come out of their work together, uh, what outcomes would you expect, what would it take in the school to make this be the norm when it comes to professional learning. And let's just take a look at a little bit of this. We just had an opportunity to take a look at 
this middle school math team engaged in team-based professional learning. And what they were doing was beginning with data about student achievement by looking at work that their students had actually produced. One of the things we found last year that killed them was they couldn't go from word problems to the equations. So um, we worked on it this year. And teachers were able to identify particular areas where their students were not performing at the rate that they wanted them to. And they were able to target specific strategies that they would try in their classrooms to address those. And then they wrote the equations. And we had several equations for them to choose from. They had to match them up. So it was self-checking at the end. If they had used one equation more than once, they know they made a mistake. Or if they had one left, they knew it would fit in there somewhere. Else. So that really helped them just to understand how to write it. The way teachers can quantify the success of this kind of professional learning is by looking at directly at their students' work, at assessments they are designing for their students in the classroom, looking collectively at work their students are doing from classroom to classroom to classroom and ultimately by looking at how their students perform on these specific areas of the state assessment. So we're not going to watch the rest of that but in the rest of this video they go they visit each other's classrooms they develop common assessments they work together uh, so that they're all sort of sharing their best practices and ideas and it reminds me when I was a principal at the end of the school year, uh, parents would come up to me and say, I want my child in Mrs. So-and-so's class next year. And they would have all these reasons why their child should go into that room. Uh, and I'll say this, and of course, I'm being recorded as I say this, but I'll still deny it if anyone uh, asks me later. Um, at the end of the year, uh, or at the beginning of the next year, it was like, okay, we've made our choices based on like all kinds of academically appropriate reasons. And some of the letters that our parents wrote, if the letters really made an argument that we weren't aware of, then, and we thought, oh gosh, based on what they said, then it would be better for a child to be in this classroom. We would take all that into consideration. But the day that we would let folks know what child was in what room was the day before the first day of school. And literally, I would walk out of the building, paste those things up on the wall, or the window facing out, <laughs> literally, run to the car because I could see other parents running to the window and I was like, I need to get out of here before they even. And then the next morning, you know, I would come in and there'd be the line out the door of my office. Um, but what I wanted to be able to say was, it doesn't matter what classroom your child is in because at this school, the teachers at the fourth grade, they're all in the learning community and they're sharing their best practices and their best ideas with each other. So you don't actually, your child doesn't even doesn't only have access to Mr. Smith's best ideas and knowledge, but he has access to all of their expertise and knowledge because they work as a collective. And they're gonna mix it up, and one time you're gonna be, the child's gonna be in this room, and the other time they're gonna be here, and they're gonna share, and all this is gonna happen because they have this kind of a model in place where they are thinking about their practice and sharing their ideas. To expand that model even further, we would see all kinds of other staff in these various conversations. People who see kids in different settings would be added to these conversations so that they could offer their input and expertise as well on what we're seeing outside, what we're seeing on the playground, what we're seeing to and from school, so that as a collective, as a collective, we can actually best meet the needs of all those children given all of our expertise. So that's the ideal. That's what we'd love to see. But I'm, I'm curious about what are some of your reactions to the video and any of these questions here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got it. Are you in those conversations sometimes? Yeah. Got it. Could you? Mm -hmm. well, I would be the only one, like the other classified staff, you know, they wouldn't get paid for it. Mm -hmm. That's how that would work. But yeah, I could probably make an effort to sit in on a grade level mm -hmm. to provide a change. Mm -hmm. Got it. So it's possible, but it's not happening right now. So I saw a hand over here. Yes. Well, uh, I think that mo most expertise in most buildings is wasted. Mm -hmm. It's actually the most valuable source of professional development. Yep. I think it'd be fair to say that a lot of people attend professional development to chase their continuing education credits. Mm -hmm. So if 
fund the charge. Um, I, uh, if I were the state, I would incentivize maybe not these kind of meetings, but schools, middle schools and high schools where it's easier for teachers to go use their prep time and observe master teachers who are mm -hmm. That should, you know, you should be able to improve credit, continuing education mm -hmm. credit, both, both teachers probably. Yep. Um, and, and then, I mean, then you'd stop wasting the, the most valuable, uh, or at least stop pending the, the expert knowledge in the building. Yep, and so a state that has figured that out is Georgia. Because in Georgia, they recognize that some of the most powerful learning happens in conversations with colleagues uh, around their practice. And they incentivize and have a way of counting those hours towards relicensure and recertification. I'm not trying to get you to move to Georgia. I'm just saying it can be done. Uh, and we have to stop wasting people's time doing things that are ineffective and don't change practice. So as an example, there was a survey that went out. Can't remember the national organization that put it out. Can't remember when it happened, but it was within the last five years. Uh, and they had a question for teachers saying, what are the top 10 things that you've done that have changed your practice for the good uh, as a teacher? And <clears throat> the authors of the survey were making one of their points by saying, look at how low professional development or professional learning is in the results. Like It's like number 11 out of 10. Uh, people just don't find value in it. But what they were listing above as professional conversation with my colleague, uh, observing a master teacher and having a chance to engage in conversation about their practice were things that they were listing as having a bigger impact on their teaching. And those are things that we would argue are professional learning. As a matter of fact, they're the highest form of professional learning. But the survey makers were saying these things weren't professional learning and so the preconceived notion that people had in their head of what professional learning was, which are sit and gets, go off to this conference, go off to this whatever, nothing happening in school connected to my practice, and certainly not something where I'm using my student data to inform what my learning needs are, those things weren't considered professional learning, at least by the authors of the survey. But yeah, follow up. There's also a protocol called Charette's, mm -hmm. I think it's pronounced that way. It's um, basically like what doctors do with um, morbidity meetings mm -hmm. where they come and they share like a failure to a room full of other doctors and mm -hmm. um, there's no there's no judgment but there's expertise that's shared yep. and this doctor will say this is how I would have done that this is how I would have done that um, it's rare but I've read that they can be just life-changing for teachers yep. if you can create a culture in your building where everyone feels safe and that to me is the ultimate professional learning because you're literally bringing your your professional problem Mm -hmm. to the table, it could even be personal life, work balance problems or whatever, um, and, and you have a room of hundreds of years often of experience, mm -hmm. um, and you leave that meeting with the best of advice from, from uh, your colleagues. I love the fact that you set up the activity that we're about to do this afternoon so well. <laughs> so thank you for that, because that's exactly what I'm, I'm going to ask you to do. i got to point back here, and then we'll go up to the front. I was just going to say something very simple. Um, anything that I do well, I have stolen from somebody. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We can be the best thieves out there when it comes to I best ideas and best practices, and we absolutely should. Yeah. Um, I just recently listened to a podcast where this woman was speaking about writing her failure resume mm -hmm. as a way of reflecting on all of the things that she learned as a result of failing, which you guys saying, mm -hmm. uh, which I had never really considered, and now I'm thinking how am I going to bring that back to the program. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Thank so, you. Thank you for that because I want to move into, by the way, one of the things that, and when you're doing professional learning, this is my strategy is, I know I'm never going to get to like all the things I plan to talk about. Like I just know I'm not going to do it, but I always have it there because you never know what the need might be. So you saw all the stuff that we skipped and what I want you to do right now is we're going to move over to this other slide deck that was actually the beginning of the breakout session. And what I'm gonna ask us to do is become our own little community of practice. And we're gonna bring a problem of practice to this community of practice so that we can collectively think about how to move forward on some of these ideas and some of the things that we're grappling with here. And I know <clears throat> we're coming at it from our own sets of experiences, our own background. No one in the room has all the expertise needed to advance these conversations, but collectively we might have pieces and parts that might help our colleagues. And that's what we're really gonna to try to do. 
Uh, I want to, you know, just to offer one more example of how we're all, I'm still challenged by some of what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm no expert in all of these issues, but I'm a continuous learner in all of these issues. And I think back to when I was a teacher, sixth grade, and I had little Damien in my classroom uh, as one of my students. And believe me, he was one of my most challenging students. And I know it was not lost on me that in some cultures and some religions, his name was literally the devil because that's how he would come to me every morning. I felt like, oh, if I could just get to Damien. And I never took the time to really know him. And I never took the time to really understand what motivated him. And so we had this exercise where I asked my kids to create a climate or like a representation of a climate, be it like a deciduous forest, or it could be an Arctic climate, it could be a jungle, but some representation of that and bring it to this class and let's talk about what you learned about that climate. And so the day that these were all due, uh, all the kids brought in their wonderful climate uh, in, or designs. <clears throat> and I looked at all the wonderful things that their parents, I mean, that they had done. <laughs> um, and, and I was just amazed by some of those things. I was just like, oh, look at this little jungle that you created. Wow. And they were just these brilliant designs. Well, here comes Damien with his half a box. It was a Nike shoe box, I'll never forget, half full of sand. And he had the nerve to sit it down with all the other projects. And I was just so angry. Like that, from that moment he set it down, I was like, he had weeks to get this done. And so I had already given him an F in my, in my brain. Like, but the, the way the process was going to work is he was going to get up, and as all the other kids did, and talk about their designs. And so as I listened to you know, student A talk about, yeah, mom and I went to the store, to the uh, Hobby Lobby, and we got all these amazing things, and, and she helped me put this together and that together. Translation, mom did it all, but she watched. Um, you know, like those are the thoughts that were not going through my head. What was going through my head was, wow, that is an amazing project that you've done. This looks beautiful. And who knows how much mom helped or didn't help, and there's all kinds of variations that could have happened, but I just assumed naively that this child understood this climate based on how well designed this project was. And multiple others before me, and then here comes Damien. And Damien started talking about his climate, and he's like, I made a desert. <laughs> and again, I'm, not, I'm barely hearing what he has to say because I've already given him an up. Like, it doesn't even matter what you say. And then he went on to talk about, uh, so you see the sand and you don't see anything else because, like, everything's died because it's just too hot and there's not been rain and, like, who knows how long. And all the other animals that were there, well, they kind of went underneath the sand because, well, they've got to figure out a way to stay cool somehow. And, like, he just went on and on really actually describing what happens in a desert, <laughs> like really, and actually understood why things were the way they were. And I sat there and the whole time was just like, I can't believe he came in here with this half a box of sand. Like, I can't believe it. And I couldn't let it go. And so the reason I bring that up is because I was stuck with this notion in my head that we can't, like he should have known better. He could have put something on the, you know, cover up the box or something with, didn't have those materials at home. Didn't have someone to take them to Hobby Lobby to get all the amazing crepe paper and all the other things. Didn't have that. But instead thought to do something and to have an explanation by it, about it that actually made sense. Uh, and then uh, he learned probably more than all the other kids who had these amazing representations, or at least as much as, if not more. So I, I just lift that up to say, we're all continuing to try to work through these things, these issues, and none of us are experts. So what I want you to do is think about something that's either in the equity space or just more generally in the professional learning space. It could be the fact that we aren't engaged in the conversations that we need to. It could be lots of different things. But I want you to think of an issue that you're grappling with as a problem or practice that's connected to anything that we've talked about since Tiffany began this morning. And just kind of take a moment to think about what that issue might be. Because we're gonna engage in a community of practice to kind of walk through <coughs> that issue. And we're gonna keep Kassab in the back of our mind because as we address this issue, whatever it might be, Kassab might be a tool that you use in terms of how to think about how to address this issue. So just have that in the back of your mind. 
And we didn't talk about Gusky a lot, but one of the things that we talked about in professional learning is there are ways to measure the impact of our professional learning going all the way from how people react to it, all the way up to what changes in terms of student learning. So this is the model that a lot of districts use in order to change their professional learning strategies. And right in the middle of the model, this organizational change, what kind of structures do we need to change in our buildings and in our schools to allow for the kind of professional learning that we want and for the results that we want. So an organizational change that I could imagine that we would hope to come from some of the learning that you're all engaged in is that more people are engaged in the learning in the schools because they are able to participate because they're invited into the conversations. That could be an organizational change that we want to pay attention to. So to get us started, I'm going to pass out this sheet. And if you would pass that that way, pass that back that way, so you'll get that one from here. And I'll collect all the extras from somewhere. All right. And for you two here. All right, so whatever the... Oh. Is everybody okay? Okay, we lost... We just, Drop the mug. Okay, got extras. And I'm gonna keep all the extras somewhere back here in case somebody, just keep the extras kind of out there because somebody might want to blank one later. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So think about your, your, your idea or the issue that you're dealing with. And I want you to personally walk through these theory of change questions. And so just to look at these questions. So what is the current situation that we intend to impact? And then whatever that is, what will it look like? I know I'm reading what's right here. I know that, but I want to pause after each one and ask some questions. What will it look like when we achieve the desired results? So the situation that we heard earlier, oh, you got it? Uh, the idea that I'm not involved in the professional learning. And I think it's important for me as a staff member in the school to be engaged in the professional learning. So what will it look like when we achieve the desired results? I will be present at grade level meetings, and whole staff meetings, particularly around issues that involve professional learning. I'll be able to offer my expertise to the conversation. I mean, those might be the kinds of things I would put in this box or anything else that you think might be helpful for our desired results. So what do we need to learn to achieve it? You know, it could be something like, I'll just keep with this example. Uh, it could be something like, we need to figure out a building schedule adjustment and strategies to change the building schedule so that I can be freed to be in those kinds of meetings. So I need to learn and I, or our building needs to learn some different ways to do our scheduling. We also may need to learn uh, different ways districts do their professional learning so that we start to value the things that happen in the school versus sending people out to just get checks and boxes to get their license renewed or whatever. Okay. What behavior needs to change for our goal to be achieved? So one of the behaviors might, that might need to be changed is our, let's say, my principal, one behavior that would really be helpful is if she recognized the expertise that I could potentially bring to some of these kinds of conversations like we saw in the video. That would be a, a really powerful behavior change. Or a behavior change has to be the system has to value the kind of professional learning that happens here or uh, um, observing a colleague who's an expert or those kinds of things, that might be a behavior that needs to change. So how will we differentiate our work, differentiate our work to meet the various learning needs? So just thinking about uh, if one learning need is, uh, we as, let's go to an example where it's an equity issue and we need to understand our biases and that's the thing that we're trying to change. So how might we differentiate our work? Well, first of all, we might start to understand, so what expertise or gifts or prior knowledge do people bring to this conversation so that we're not always starting from scratch, assuming that everyone knows not, no one knows anything? So how do we differentiate our learning experiences so that I can share my expertise so that we can differentiate the learning? And then monitoring our progress with whatever the idea is that you're taking through this process, how much you monitor to let you know whether or not anything is actually happening that's different, and that's very similar to how we measure our effectiveness. The one way I might measure my effectiveness with the earlier example is 
I can now say that I'm at 80% of all um, professional learning sessions compared to the 0% I was a part of before. And we'll measure my effectiveness by the number of times I'm there. So think about your own personal issue or idea or thing that you're grappling with. And the reason it's gonna be important to take time to fill in these boxes is because when I break you up into two groups, you're gonna be sharing some of what you put in these boxes with your colleagues and one of you will have an opportunity to actually share all of this in great detail and get feedback from the rest of the group, but all of you will be sharing the kinds of things that you put into these boxes. So I'm gonna give you about five minutes to really think through your responses to these theory of change questions. All right. So we're gonna use what's called a tuning protocol to make use or engage in conversation around, let me a few more, around what you just did. And the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do on this tuning protocol is you'll notice that the numbers on the screen are different than the numbers on the piece of paper that I'm about to give you. So scratch out, because I always have to adjust this based on the actual amount of time that we have. So scratch out whatever numbers are in front of each of these sections as we come to them and write in the new numbers if you would. All right. Mm -hmm. There you go, and extra. All right, everyone have the protocol. And, and then, so the extras just, and then again, later, whoever wants any of these extras will please take. Okay. <clears throat> this is one of those situations where I ask you to follow the protocol exactly how it's written this first time, and then later think about how you might adjust. And this is a professional learning strategy just to get ideas out of, you know, from our colleagues and, and have a chance to get some advice and do all the things that our colleague in the back said are some of the highest forms of professional learning. Step one. Each person, t in this 10 minutes, for there'll be two groups, okay? And our, each group will have like six or seven people in the groups, all right? So keep in mind that the first thing is a facilitator needs to be named for the group <clears throat> because that person will be the one who says, okay, we gotta get back on schedule, we're falling off, you know, we gotta have somebody monitoring those kinds of things. So when you get into your groups, choose that person quickly and that person will have their phone out, paying attention to the time and also making sure that all the voices get heard. So step one, everybody kind of shares not their entire answer to all seven questions, please don't do that, but quickly says, okay, here's our issue. I'm not involved in our professional learning or experiences in the school, and I'm grappling with how to do that. Done. Next person goes and shares their issue that they're working with, and then after everyone shared, hopefully 10 minutes has gone by and no more, because after everyone shares, uh, the group takes, what did I say, five minutes to choose one problem of all the ones that they heard. Let's work on this one because we all perhaps maybe have expertise that we can share for this person and or maybe this issue is representative of some of the other issues in the group as well. So as a collective, let's choose the one. So five minutes, and I hope you're making these changes on the sheet so that you know the exact times we're talking about here. Okay, the next, we got 10 minutes where that person then starts to walk through their theory of change responses. It really starts to describe what they would like to see as a desired state, and maybe even share a couple ideas <coughs> that she or me, he might have about how to get from current state to desired state. So this is when you can go through your sheet and say, well, here's kind of what I was thinking. Now, this is where it gets tricky. Now, after hearing that for 10 minutes, and this person is speaking uninterrupted, okay, so let this person just talk. The reason that's hard is because you're all gonna wanna say, right, as soon as a question pops into your head, you're gonna wanna say, so what you're saying is blah, 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 and then that's gonna take the conversation down a path that we don't wanna necessarily go down. Could perhaps want to, but we don't want to now. Let that person speak uninterrupted. And then ask your clarifying questions. Five minutes for that. Here's a clarifying question. So when you're saying you're not able to go into the uh, grade level team meetings, does that mean it never happens or it rarely happens? That's a clarifying question. This is not a clarifying question. Well, why don't you just tell the principal that you wanna be in the meetings uh, so that you can make sure that you get there and get into all those meetings? Well, that's not a clarifying question. That's your idea and suggestion in the form of a question. So clarifying questions are just to get more details or information so that when then you are working with your colleagues to talk through some ideas, you've got all the information you need. 
And here's where it gets really tricky. So you're going to be kind of broken up into two sides of the room. And the person with the representative problem is going to turn her or his chair away from the group, but be close enough where they can hear the conversation that's going on in the group. And the group is going to have a conversation about this person's issue, what they brought to the table. And they're just going to talk about, here's something that I wish they would consider, and they have thought about this, and one of the things that we're doing in my unit or school is this. And that conversation is going to happen, and this person is going to be listening in and taking notes. There's a specific reason why we ask that person to turn around and face away, but you'll experience that, and you can perhaps tell me why you thought that made sense or not. And then finally, you come back in the five minutes that you have left, and that person turns their chair around and says, here's what I heard, here's some ideas that I think I can take back to my setting, and offers their reflections on what was said. So those are the steps in the process. What questions do you have? I'm going to count you off one, two, one, two, and we're going to be into our two groups that way. So if you would start here in the front. One. Oh, and remember your number. OK, <laughs> so one. And one. One's over here, please. This is your space. You might want to, is this yours? It is. Okay. Yeah, just one's over here, two's over here, and engage in the protocol. And I'm going to stop you in, let's see, 10, 20, 25, 35, 40 minutes. So you can imagine how hard it is to try to bring what I know are some powerful conversations to a close. Let's stay where you are. And a couple questions that are on the screen that I'd like you to just kind of process out loud with me. First of all, with the protocol, we'll get to your actual problem in a second, but with the protocol itself and the process that you just went through, reactions, how did it go? What worked well, what didn't, what would you change? What, what are your wonderings? Yeah. Came up. Mm -hmm. yep. Can't butt in. Yeah. Or, or you know, she's turned around. Can't can't talk to her at that point. Mm -hmm. Other reactions. Yeah. I think it's helpful to break down the process. Mm -hmm. Look at each piece separately in depth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things though is like you know when you have a meeting and then everybody starts and then all of a sudden before you know it there's like sidebar conversations. Right. So I think that's this process helped having that because it's yep. kind of like annoying when everybody's trying to talk and then you have sidebar before you know it everybody's doing their own thing. Right. And so this force. Topic and now you don't even know what you're talking about. Right. So this forces you to at least stay committed to a process and engaging all voices. Hopefully. What did it feel like turning around to the people who turned around? What was that like? That didn't bother me at all. It was actually um, freeing. I felt to only have to write because if I felt like I had to look at everybody's face while they were talking, I wouldn't have written down nearly as much as I did. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of good information that I was able to write down. Mm -hmm. Or I would have, or I would have <laughs> felt at the time you would have had to respond to them. Where it's like, right, all right. of that would be play, going because you're, you can't, like you can say, I can say to you, don't talk, mm -hmm. but you're going to have these expressions on your face that you can't, unless you're in a brilliant poker player, you're going to have these expressions on your face where you hear an idea that you like, and I'm like, mm, okay, yeah. And when you hear an idea that you don't, it might be a blank stare, or it might be like, why did they come up with that? Like, I mean, so this force, all, and I was able to see the faces, by the way, of the people who were turned around. So I could tell some of the ideas that they were liking uh, as they were being, as they heard those ideas, because you, they had expressions on their face, or they smiled because they knew that someone kind of hit a point that they're like, oh yeah, I can tell you about that. Oh, there's our timer. <laughs> so, uh, so that was that's part of the reason behind that is so that that doesn't get in the way of the process, the turning around. Um, and to your point, I think what we do after we go through it the first time is then we say, how do we modify it for our setting so that we can take care of a piece of it that we think might be better off if we did X, like 
in the middle of that, when she's turned around, you have one opportunity to ask a clarifying question at that point or something. You know, you can think about what that change might be. So now let's get to the ideas. Um, either group, either the person who had the idea or the people in the group, how did it go? And did you walk away with something that is useful? Either, either side. So we'll start with you, Richard. Can you repeat that question? Did you, did, you, did you get something you can use out of the conversation? Can you tell us what was the problem? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so he'll share his problem during the break. Uh, but you're saying you did get something that you could use. Group members, did you feel like you had things to contribute, or how did it feel for you in terms of the actual discussion? Suggesting was much more objective in my in my, in my way of thinking than it had it, since he had been sitting here. That it had, that it had been just uh, you know making up well what ifs and, and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, trying to just speak to the to the problem itself, mm -hmm. come up with some solutions that were concrete and something that could maybe be used uh, objectively. Gotcha. No, thank you for that. Let's go to this side, either the person with the problem or the people who gave ideas, reactions. Um, I got a lot of great ideas. I conceived being able to take the ideas that were shared and the process of going through how to, how to define the problem um, to my site for sure. Awesome. So both the worksheet I find is going to, I think is going to be very valuable, but additionally in going through the process, I was able to walk away with some things that I feel like I can bring back to. That's great. That's, that's what we were hoping for. What about from the group? Yeah. Yeah, please. I've been to a thousand meetings, professional developments. <laughs> well, that's a lot. <laughs> That's a, that's a that's lot. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just the buy-in in this 20 minutes is a million times higher because the problem was specific and it was a real person who actually wanted solutions. I, f I find most of the discussions around PD to be abstract um, and it makes a world of difference when it's not. Well, I'm glad that that's your response and your reaction and I'm glad that you walked away with the couple of things that you can try and actualize right away. And I thank you all for leaning into this process and, and being the kind of support system for your colleagues. I wish we had time to do this for everyone in the group, but what I hope that you'll do is you'll take this consultancy protocol is what it's called, or tuning protocol, uh, and think of ways that you might modify it for your own, for your own setting. Um, if we had time, we would go through some of these questions. We're a bit out of time. What I'm gonna ask is just to look at this video because it's my hope that you walked away with some new ideas uh, after your conversation today. Ideas are scary. They come into this world ugly and messy. Ideas are frightening because they threaten what is known. They are the natural born enemy of the way things are. So it's my hope that you walk away with some real ideas that you can put into practice. Every time I watch that video, I almost tear up over the idea. I'm like, that's such a, I wanna like hug the idea <laughs> just to make the idea feel better. Uh, but I hope that you walked away with some ideas that you can put into practice. Remember uh, what Tony said at the beginning, uh, the, the um, QR code that you need to actually rate the session. Please make sure that you do that. She said that there was a um, URL if you didn't have the QR code. And I can, who needs the URL just in case they don't have the QR code? So, okay. So I just want to thank you for your time this morning or this afternoon. And, 
<laughs> oh, yeah, if you change stressors. Have a great rest of the year. Thank you all for your time this morning, this afternoon. Really appreciate it, everyone. Thank you.